It's always fun to play a little harmonica because if you only do three or four bars, you sound like a pro, even if you don't know what you're doing, which I don't. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hello everyone. Nice to have you back with us again. This is George the Antique Nomad and I am enjoying the last pleasant day in the Midwest. It's supposed to get very cold after this. And that's fortunate timing for me because my next show is next weekend in Florida. So I am getting packed and ready. And I've been going through some of the hauls that I got across country as I drove here from Seattle and looking at some of the little things and the more modern and hip and cool things that seem to sell down in Florida. So let's take a look. On my left here, your right, I have a bunch of modernist glass from the 50s and 60s and 70s, and it actually looks like it all goes together, but it's come from some very different places. This particular piece here is Murano, this orange with the poles. And you'll see pieces like this in the 50s and 60s coming out of Italy. And in the 70s, you'll also see them coming out of Canada because there was a glass blowing company called Chalet that hired Italian designers to do exactly this type of pulled work with the bright oranges and ambers and other vivid colors. These were really popular in the 1950s after the Second World War. A lot of GI started to go to Murano on tours when they had leave and then they'd send pieces back to the United States and it caused a real mania for it in the 1950s and 60s. Murano also is the origin of this piece from what I understand with the big lips. There are a number of um, designers in Italy who did face related vases and they've been done all the way up until the 1990s. Uh, this particular teal one I believe is from the 1960s and that was a neat find. I got that um, in a little store in Russell, Kansas of all places where Bob Dole and Arlen Specter were from. That's their big claim to fame but they've got a good antique mall there too. Also in that store in Kansas, I found these two. And what was special to me about these is that they are rainbow glass out of West Virginia. They did all these cool bottles with the minaret look. And their Pontel is a little different than Pilgrim and Blanco. It has, it's almost like a navel where there's sort of a little bit of an overlap there. That's one way you can tell rainbow because it almost never has its original sticker or tag. But here is this one and it says, America's first industry glass established 1608, Rainbow Art Glass, Huntington, West Virginia. And it is hand blown. It's got a little tag about the collection. This is going to date to the 19, late 60s. And it's really cool to have found one. I've been buying and selling this for years and years. And this is the first one I've ever had that had the paper label. Uh, so how about that? And right next to it was the same one in teal. So of course I had to have them both. I paid about $20, $24, somewhere in there for each one of these. They sell for me for about $50 to $60 a piece uh, because they are definitely favored by the mid-century modernist uh, decorator. And this one is also rainbow glass. This one has a nice crackle finish to it. Crackles achieved by taking the glass while it's still hot, I mean really hot, like 1500 degrees, they pull it out, they blow it, and then before they put it back in to cool, they stick it in a really cold tank of water and pull it out really fast. And it causes all this internal cracking, but the heat of the glass fuses it all right back together again so it doesn't break, but it gives it that neat crackle effect. And there are people who strictly look for crackle glass to collect. Now another glass piece I found, and again it was an unlikely place, this was in uh, Boise, Idaho, is this little drop bowl by Higgins. This is a small one, but they did larger versions with these sort of peacock feather effects in the bottom. This was fused glass, they'd do layers and layers, and then they'd drop out the bottom to create the bowl, and they would hand embellish with gold. Right here is Higgins, the name on the edge of the glass. And the Higgins were a couple in the Chicago area who made this sort of, uh, these sort of pieces 
from the 19 late 50s until they passed on in the late 1990s, a uh, friend of mine, the fellow who has Tom Gore's collection in Seattle, uh, Epic Antique Mall, he got to meet them when they were still alive and he said they were just wonderful people and they did such great work. Most of their pieces are much larger than that and very showy. That little bowl I think I paid six or seven dollars for because the person who had it must have missed the signature or didn't care. It's probably worth 25 to 30 maybe a little bit more their big pieces can go in the hundreds of dollars and they have some really masterful pieces that are in the four figure range now something that sort of has that 50s look that i thought was really cool i've seen lots of panthers we see a lot of royal hager panthers we see other companies that made panthers but this one is different because this is we've you may have heard of weeping gold this is weeping silver so what it is, is it has a silver metallic paint and they do a texturing on it. That's the weeping part so that some of it is on a gloss surface and some of it is matte and that gives it this unusual spotted finish. And I thought this was a really cool piece. I just don't see silver at all. Um, there's been some odd glazes that have been being discovered lately. Another thrifter online found one that had a, a Hager piece that had a really unusual sort of marbled glaze from the early 70s. And so uh, I guess these are starting to come out of the woodwork and I think they're really cool. And of course, Panthers sell like crazy in Florida. So I don't expect to have that very long. I expect that that'll sell for about $25. And I think I paid under 10. Um, I do a lot of my shopping in antique malls. I think people are surprised by that because they figure that antique malls and shops have priced everything to the full retail. But that's not always true. Certain things sell better in some areas than another. I got this piece, for example. Oh, there's the last ladybug of the season on there. You might be able to see. Uh, she's going to have a drink before she flies away home. Um, so this is one of these 1950s and 60s vintage cocktail recipe glasses that has all of the different recipes on the outside. I haven't had this exact one in a long time. There's various styles of these, and they're really collectible. They're perfect around the holidays and New Year's. And this one dates to the about 1960 in this red and black. Um, I got this in Ogden, Utah, and of course, Utah is not a place that is particularly fond of alcohol and so it turns out to be a great place to buy alcohol related collectibles because they don't really want them there. Another piece that I got there and I just got it for a laugh and I think judging by the polls slightly under half of you will think this is great and slightly over half of you will not but that's okay because it's really just a cool old piece and I buy things that I think someone will like and I don't mind controversy. This was done in the 60s. I don't know what letter for school this was, but somehow it ended up being MAGA. So I thought this is going to get someone's attention for sure. So I picked it up. I think it was a few dollars. I expect it'll sell for eight or ten. And I think it will be a, a fun conversation piece in the meantime. And I like to have people have conversation in the booth. It's okay with me, whatever side of things someone's on. I just like the idea that the antiques and vintage are an expression of the full range of all ideas, values, people, and opinions in the past, and that diversity is part of what really attracts me to this business. Now, in terms of other decorative items that are modernist, this piece here, it's got a $15 tag on it, and it says rare. Let's talk for just a minute about the use of rare. Rare is a term that, please, if it's really rare, rare means there might be half a dozen that were ever made in the world or less, or something very, very scarce. In coins, you're talking about something where there's a minuscule amount of production. The word scarce is a good way to describe something that you don't see very often but is out there. Rare, this is not rare. This is cool, but it's not rare. What it is, however, is it is a McCoy piece. You can see McCoy on the bottom, I think. 
And McCoy is, uh, was an Ohio pottery company. They were one of the big ones. And they were known for fairly crude, but rustic and interesting uh, ware that was largely done through uh, florists and people buying things for planters and just basic use. They decided they needed to do something more modern. So they came out with this line. You'll see it in oranges and other colors as well. This pink and green is a scarce combination. And so I haven't seen a piece in many years. And here this was again at the little mall in Kansas. And I think that the dealer was having a 30% off sale. So I paid around $10 for it. I have a friend who collects this sort of thing and I'll probably charge her, you know, 12 or 15 just as a favor. But if I was gonna put it out for sale, I would ask 25. Another thing that's 50s oriented, speaking of colors, I love promotional cars and advertising pieces, and lots of other people do too. And this one is a 1960 Rambler, and this is, the, I believe, the cross-country station wagon, long before Volvo used the cross-country term Rambler, who really popularized the station wagon in this country, is the company that made the cross-country. It was their wagon back in the 50s. By 1960, Rambler had basically saved the Nash and American Motors Company and everything they made was called a Rambler at that point. With these promo cars, you really have to look for condition. Uh, the roof rack is in good shape. It's not melted, it's not warped, it's not broken, it's not missing stuff and the color is all there. That's what you need to look for in promotional cars. People like them regardless and they'll buy them if they look like a rat rod, but they won't pay much. On the other hand, in good condition because station wagons are a fad again, probably looking at about $50, and I think I paid $22 for that piece. Again, like I said, I'm not afraid to go into an antique store because I buy things that are like these things, everything you're seeing here are things that were not popular in the area where I got them, and that's why they were priced in a way that I was able to buy them from a full retail antique store and take them somewhere else and still make money. Another thing that came from Kansas, and obviously I have a theme going here, I looked for all the sin items because I was in an area of the country where people are rather proper about things, and so there wasn't a customer for these things there, but I have lots of customers in Florida who love these cards. I can't show you because we're on YouTube, but, uh, ooh, another ladybug. Um, these are 52 art studies, and they are very artful. They're all nude women. The one on the bottom there, if you can see her, I think is Betty Page. If she's not, she's definitely a look-alike. And Betty Page did pose in a lot of topless and semi-nude photos. And so this is an entire deck. Uh, very important to count and make sure everything is there, including the Jokers, and this deck was complete. Uh, I paid 10 for this. These sell for about 25 for me, generally. Now these are a little tamer and very cute. And this is made in Germany. This is a little older. Uh, the Made in Germany label makes this probably 1930s with these uh, nice designs. Maybe even now actually looking at the portraits, probably earlier, maybe more like 1920 vintage. Um, Unsere Lieblinge, M. Hohner. Hohner is the biggest maker of harmonicas and always has been. And Unsere Lieblinge means our pretties, our lovelies. Inside we've got the harmonica and it's uh, got the Honer label and everything. Now Honer made stuff like the Marine Band that uh, looks like an old box and is still made recently, but this is a model that definitely is older. It's always fun to uh, play a little harmonica because if you only do three or four bars you sound like a pro, even if you don't know what you're doing, which I don't. Um, I'm not sure, oh, this is the key of F. They all come in different keys, and one of the reasons that they're collectible and viable for people is musicians do look for them in different keys. And most of the ones that I sell do go back into use, so I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I like to buy a lot of little things that are easy to transport because I travel so much, and because a lot of the people who buy from me travel as well. So I look for little oddball things like tins. These are Rexall orderlies, a pleasant and effective laxative ideal for children, aged people, and invalids, as well as robust persons. I suppose that the robust persons needed it less, but this is a Rexall tin. This is going to be from about 1920. I paid a couple dollars for it, and little tins like this usually go for six or eight or ten. 
Uh, some tins can be very valuable depending what they are. I look for oddball things, <laughs> funnily enough, like laxatives and suppositories and odd things like that because people think that they're funny and buy them as novelties. I have a friend who's in the business and she had someone stay with her and they got into her medicine cabinet so she fixed them the next time they came over. She put all these old tins and things like that for all sorts of horrible things because she figured they were snooping on her to see what malady she might have. So she said, well, I got them pretty confused. These two little pieces on the in this hand, I have a, this is a pencil topper for 7-Up. These would have been given out to school kids in the 50s and 60s for free so that they would be carrying advertising around. And they're collectible now. Uh, it says I paid $4.50 on it. I didn't. They only sell for 6 or $7. I think I paid $2.50. I think it was on sale or half price, two and a quarter. Um, this is a folding knife. I always buy pocket knives. I like advertising ones as well as the ones that were serious uh, for people to use. What's nice about this is that it does have a lot of convenient things and it does have the advertising from about 1970. And this one actually has a lot of blades. Uh, it's got a um, uh, scraper, it's got a little pair of scissors, it's got a file, and it has a little uh, two blades. So um, this would have been made in Japan for Barlow. And there are definitely people who uh, collect this sort of stuff because they're useful and also because they just like to have them around. Along the same line are advertising fobs. I bought a whole bunch of these again at that store in Kansas. What a great store that was. I can't wait to go back someday. It made driving through the plains of Kansas much more interesting knowing I had somewhere to go. These are issued by Caterpillar, and on the front, you'll see the Caterpillar tractor. That's a standard thing. And then on the back, the company that sold them, whichever distributor, could put their information on. So you see sort of copper-coated and silver-coated, and they've got the machines on them. That's what's interesting to people about these now. These were given out for guys to put their watches on back in the, uh, they started really way back in the late Victorian period, but you see them all the way up into the, about the 1950s, um, 50s, early 60s, and by then most of the people who wore them really weren't doing that anymore, so they kind of fade away at that point. Uh, pretty collectible. I paid about $7 a piece. I usually get about $17 a piece on average, 17 to 20 depending on the motifs. So. Um, again, just a fun thing to have. I like to have lots of l fun things in little cases because it peeps, keeps people in the booth longer. And I like to get lots of little guy stuff like this because uh, men and women often shop antique shows together and then uh, if I've got pretty and interesting things of a more feminine nature, then I've got something for the guys to look at and then they both feel okay about buying something. So it's kind of my little strategy. Um, these lighters here are all Zippo. A uh, little hard for me to hold where you can see all, but I look for Zippo lighters. I look for lighters in general, but Zippo is the most collected. The older mark might be able to see there has Zippo in capital letters, a, a sort of an italicized way that has motion, and it has little marks next to it, little straight line marks, and those marks will help you identify the year it was made. This one's a little more desirable because it's U.S. Naval Station, Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico, Crossroads of the Caribbean. The military ones tend to go for more money, usually $20 to $25 a piece. I never pay more than about seven for these. This one is Bud Dry. You'll see the later logo on the bottom. So this is a more recent piece. I think they changed the logo maybe in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but anything to do with beer always sells. And then this one's for the Daytona 500. And again, my next show's in Florida, so I look for Florida stuff. Kind of along the same line, and again, I got these in Ogden, Utah, because they were uh, not popular there, because they have to do with beer. But these are little beer bottles. They're like airline bottle size. I don't know that they were actually given out for the airlines. I think they were actually given out as promotional items. I don't know quite how they were distributed, but they came around in the era where they made the most. This is 1950s, and they're all these great regional beers, many of which don't produce anymore. This one is Jack's. If you've ever been to New Orleans, you've seen the big Jack's neon sign downtown, and that has to do with that. Kingsbury, we've got East Side, we've got Goble. There's going to be a number of different makers here, and so it represents all the way from 
Rupert's of New York. Uh, Fall City Beer is on the Ohio River in the Louisville area. Uh, so, because they represent so many different areas, there's nostalgia for these old companies that aren't around anymore, and advertising collectors like them. So, I don't expect them to last long at all. Again, because I was in Utah, I paid under $4 a piece for those. Elsewhere, they sell for 8 and 10 and 12 a piece. Along that line as well, I bought a bunch of banks, and beer again, the Mets Barrel Bank. This one I paid $7.50 for. It sells for 20 to 25. It's a nice one from about 1960 made of ceramic. I got a couple of other banks as well. The cast iron dog here is going to date from the 1920s and he has a package on his back. That's what makes him a little bit unusual. I haven't seen this one very often before. They sell for $35 to $45 in the right place, and I think I paid about $15 for him. I also uh, got this little Liberty Bell. We see the Liberty Bell a lot. This one is from a little place in Kansas, but this is an older one where it actually has the quotation, proclaim liberty throughout all the land, and unto all the inhabitants thereof, Leviticus 25 verse 10. That makes it a little more unusual. This is going to be earlier uh, before the Second World War, and that's going to make this a little more valuable, probably in the $20 to $25 range. And I think I paid about, oh gosh, 6 or $8, as I recall. Now, getting back to our uh, sin things here, I bought this pack of cigarettes. And, of course, you can't sell these to anyone under 18, but it's got the LSMFT, which was Lucky Strike More Flavorful Taste logo on the top there and it's Lucky Strike Filters. The reason I buy old cigarette packs, if it doesn't have the Surgeon General's warning, it's before 1964 and that's why people collect them. So that was the appeal there. I did sort of skip over one other set of banks. I thought these were really cute. Hadn't seen these before. This was Inesco, which like Lefton and Norcrest were some of those Japanese companies where an American company would have things made in Japan. These are pessimist banks. And the purpose of the pessimist bank was really as a novelty. And you've got the man and the woman. And they both look very dour and, and very concerned and very certain that things aren't going to work out which is a shame. And so the bank has nice spider webs painted on them because, of course, we're never getting into the bank because there's nothing in it. Uh, the funny part to me is they didn't even bother putting a trap on the bottom because I suppose a pessimist is not going to have money, so they didn't need to have any way to hold coins in there. Those date to about 1960. They were a great deal. I think they were $10 for the pair, and I looked them up, and they sell for about 25 each. So that was a nice find. Also in that store, this was, uh, boy, I'm going to have to go back to Kansas, uh, were these two little head vases. Now, head vases were made starting in the 1940s in this country, and it really became the province of the Japanese makers in the 50s and 60s, and they started to do better and better work. They're very cute. Most of these were just made to be thrown away. They were little novelty vases that came from the florist with a little bouquet in them, and when you were done, you were supposed to toss it. Fortunately, not everybody did. These are marked Inarco, Cleveland, Ohio, 1963, and they're the small size, and the small size are actually a little harder to find than the big. People like them when they have jewelry that hangs off them, and they're in good condition, no chips or cracks, and because of that, I paid, I think, 15 a piece, and I usually get about 30 for them. And let's see here, a little bit of lighting. We have the Michelob Classic Dark, and that's probably 80s or so, but that's actually from a tavern and would have been at the cash register to light that. And these sell really well. People love to use them as desk lamps in man caves and that sort of thing. So uh, I think I paid 15 for that. It should sell for 30 to 35. This came off an old gas station pump, the finest, and I suspect this was Pure because Pure had the blue and white uh, signs and I was in the part of the country where those gas stations used to be. I paid 10 for it. These usually sell for 25 to 30. There was a big warehouse find that came out of St. Louis about five years ago and so there was a little bit of a glut for a while, but now they've all been distributed and so um, they're starting to be hard to find again. 
And then this little guy is a nightlight, and this is what they call helm scene, where they take a picture of an actual scene and then use it in plastic to make a shade. So that's kind of a cool thing. That'll actually hang around till I go out west again. And I think I paid five for it, and they're worth about 25 to 30 also. And then to wrap up here, one last modernist piece. This is by Sasha Brostov, and Sasha Brostov, it's, uh, he had a factory in Los Angeles uh, from 1947 to, I believe, 1953, and then it burned down, and they rebuilt, and the second factory used a different logo on the bottom. So this is the first factory. This piece is from about 1950, and look how wildly ahead of its time it is. The shape, the form, this gold on gold, these modernist spokes, um, I wish I could remember the name of this pattern. Maybe someone uh, will tell me or I'll be able to look it up and put it in. But it is a neat piece and it is not something that I've seen in a long time. Uh, his stuff is very graceful and really a lot of fun. And modernist collectors love it. I have a guy in Florida who I think will buy this the moment I take it out of the box. And I got a really good deal on this. Again, it was in the part of the country in Kansas where uh, they had this sort of thing when it was the thing, but they don't really collect it or prize it there. So I think I paid 15 for that. It's worth probably 45. So I had a lot of fun and I'm gonna have fun showing this all off in Florida next week. and looking forward to seeing you. And I look forward to seeing all of you again on another broadcast. This is George the Antique Nomad, and thanks for listening, and we'll see you again. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below Click the bell to be notified when new videos upload. Leave a comment below and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now.